Hi folks. So there's an old saying, don't say anything if you can't find anything positive to say. Well, to the good, there are some positives this week uh, in the re reading assignment, and I'll start with putting those out. But I have to admit, there's a couple of really major points that I think uh, are questionable and capable of being challenged, and I would be ill serving you if I did not point those out. So, to the good. Let's get started with a PowerPoint. So I will have some images to share with you all. So our author, to his credit, I'm pleased to see that he refers to the works of Lucretius. Let me see if I can get the PowerPoint to work here. Okay, page 139, he does cite Lucretius, who was a major Roman philosopher. Uh, let me strongly recommend this book, The Swerve, which came out a few years ago. It's the history about the redis rediscovery of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, the way of the world, or the way of nature. Now, some scholars have gone so far as to uh, credit the rediscovery of this work as being one of the major points that sparked the Renaissance. And we also know, by the way, that it was a considerable influence on no less a figure than Thomas Jefferson, who owned many a uh, number of copies of uh, Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. Now, Lucretius, who is portrayed here, was a follower of Epicurus. So I must admit, I'm puzzled why our author doesn't cite the original source for Lucretius's philosophical materialism, which implies that after the dissolution of the body, the person no longer exists. Epicurus, uh, when we talk about materialism in the context of philosophy, what we mean is that all things are material, uh, that we can't point to anything immaterial in existence. So now Epicurus famously said, death does not concern us because as long as we exist, death is not here. And once it does come, we no longer exist. In keeping with this notion, it was common for Epicureans to have the following statement uh, inscribed on their tombstones, non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. Roughly translated, that means I was not, I was. I do not, I am not, I do not care. Now, to the good, our author on page 136 through 138 does a pretty good job of setting out the two major difficulties with the conceptual question uh, concerning whether it is meaningful to believe in life after death. But then on page 138, he just states that we should just assume that those problems can be solved. Uh, Am I mistaken, folks, or is that a bit of a cop out? To the good. Our author does a pretty good job of setting up a philosophical argument for life after death on pages 138 through 140. However, he offers no source to support the assertion that the soul has no parts. Evidence? Moreover, he states that the soul is not a material thing, which raises the question. Is there such a thing as a thing that is not material? Seems a bit of a reach to me. How would we identify a thing that is not material? But as I said, there's a couple of major issues that we find here. On pages 140 through 143, he frames what he states is a scientific argument for the afterlife. But what is his basis? An article from the journal of the Society for Psychical Research. There's a couple of problems with that, however. This journal does not have much of a reputation amongst actual scientists. For example, the particle physicist, physicist Victor Stenger observed, their journals have never succeeded in achieving a high level of credibility in the eyes of the rest of the scientific community. Most articles begin with the assumption that psychic phenomena are demonstrated realities. But we 
my call begging the question. Such an assumption is known as confirmation bias, which necessarily undermines the credibility of whatever is discovered, quote unquote, as a result. Another legitimate scientist, one Igor Lloyd Tukat, a professor of physiology and himself a physician, observed that most of the members of this organization have no training in psychology fitting them for this task and have been the victims of pronounced bias as sometimes they themselves have admitted. Indeed, when I looked up the list of the presidents of this organization, most of them honestly were either philosophers or classicists. Very few of them had any background at all in the sciences. Therefore, I'm sorry, but I think we have to take anything from this organization with more than a grain of salt. Moreover, I have to wonder why our author did not instead address the phenomenon of near-death experiences, NDEs for short. Those at least have the advantage of being supported by a number of testimonies. However, most scientists do not accept accounts, these accounts as evidence of the afterlife and put this experience down to things that have been determined to occur when the brain is in the process of dying. Uh, the video of Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about this issue is pretty typical of the scientific take on this. Moreover, these accounts raise a number of important problems if specifically you are an exclusivist, Abrahamic theist. How do we account for the fact that when people have such near-death experiences, if they encounter a deity, it's always what a coincidence that our particular deity, Christians, for example, might encounter Jesus, Muslims might encounter the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Hindus might encounter Vishnu or Shiva or one of their other gods. Now, as a omnist myself, omnism is the belief that all religions are true. I have no difficulty with this notion. It makes sense to me that the divine would manifest itself in a manner that was most comfortable to the person they manifest to. But if you're an exclusivist, the notion that there's only one true religion, this aspect does raise some important issues. Also, how to account for the fact that only 10 or 20% of people who um, Briefly die and are resuscitated, have this experience. If an afterlife is universal, you would expect the odds of someone experiencing a near death experience would be much, much higher. Now, usually in academic, personal anecdotes is not relevant or appropriate, but I think I will um, take a break from that for just a moment because, but consider this illustration of the point that I'm making not proof because it is personal anecdote. So speaking for myself, I twice now nearly died. One time I ceased breathing for a, a good solid 10 or 15 minutes. No beautiful light, no floating outside my body, no bright tunnel or encounters with dead relatives, just inky blackness, utter calm, and the sense that my identity was gradually ebbing away. Should I infer, infer then that I and apparently 80 to 90 percent of humanity do not have immortal souls? Admittedly, uh, that might be part of the reason why I find the works of the Stoics and the Epicureans appealing. Believing they had no afterlife, both schools focused upon taking responsibility for making the most of this life while yet they lived. Now, <clears throat> another brilliant problem. On pages 143 through 145, our author frames what he dubs the theological argument. There's some issues with that. First, sorry, but relevance? This is supposed to be a book on the philosophy of religion. It's not supposed to be theology. So why bring up theology in a book on philosophy? On page 143, we find this statement. God has created finite persons to exist in fellowship with himself. I have to interject evidence. Um, 
But if this is true, then it seems to contradict his own purpose and his love for his creatures if he allows them to perish completely when his purpose for them remains unfulfilled. Now, a lot of theisms have no issue with this. Malthus assumed that we can know something of the creator from its creation. And given willful pain, suffering, and injustice, it follows that the creator, the creator is not beneficent or loving. Moreover, many religions, uh, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, either do not assume um, a personal afterlife. Turn back to my PowerPoint here. If, uh, okay, do uh, Hinduism and Buddhism either do not assume personal afterlife, the goal is nirvana, where you lose your individual consciousness and awareness and you become one with the universe. Or Confucianism and Taoism, just to cite a couple of different examples, have few, if any, direct teachings about an afterlife. In fact, there's a passage in the Confucian Analects to the effect that uh, one day, apparently, uh, one of Confucius's students said to Confucius, O oh, Master, can you teach us of the gods and of the afterlife? And Confucius's response, a bit sarcastic, I think, was, why should I teach you about the afterlife? If you have not yet demonstrated to me that you have mastered how to live this life first. So our author, once again, is using the broad term theistic God to refer solely to the Abrahamic God and makes little, if any, allowance for the fact that there are a lot of other theisms which I've covered in an earlier announcement. Uh, and the a lot of these other theisms do not have the issue that he just raised on page 143. Uh, so let me just finally add in academe, it does not suffice merely to read and understand the text. We need, must also be willing to engage with it actively, critically, and independently. To the good, in my estimation, our author does provide some good food for thought. Uh, in this chapter. However, I'm not sure if his scientific, quote unquote, and theological, quote unquote, arguments stand up to examination. But more to the point, what do you think? And why? There's my thoughts. And there's my answer. My can. <laughs>